Modern horse breeds are descended from those that Eastern European steppe herders domesticated in the Neolithic. These people were the Indo-Europeans, pastoralists whose ethno-linguistic legacy spread all over the globe. It should come as no surprise that the most important sacrificial animal in their religion was the horse. The very power of their kings depended on an elaborate ritual horse sacrifice. In this video, we will look at the rite of horse sacrifice in various Indo-European traditions in order to get an idea of why the Proto-Indo-Europeans considered it such an important royal ritual and what it looked like. The horse was a potent symbol in the Indo-European belief system. Special rituals relating to the king involved the sacrifice of a white stallion. This white or grey horse symbolised the sun and its sacrifice was part of a solar ritual which related both to the king and the fertility of the land. Horses were also associated with the underworld and the dead. One of the earliest Indo-European archaeological cultures is called Yamnaya. These people sometimes buried wagons in an apparent sacrificial rite. The earliest horse burials are found among the contemporary and neighbouring Samara culture of the 4th millennium BC. We can see religious continuity in later steppe cultures, such as at Sintashta, where five cemeteries have been documented from the 3rd and 2nd millennia BC. The largest is Sintashta Mogila, with 40 graves, including many horse sacrifices, with as many as 8 per grave and also chariot burials, like this one from Grave 30. These are the oldest chariots ever found, and it is believed the Sintashta people invented war chariots around 2000 BC, at which point the chariot took on the same religious symbolic role as the horse had previously. A symbol of the sun. Although most of the meat they ate was beef, the horse was more important than the cow in sacrifices to the gods. Horses were sacrificed more than any other animal. The words for horse in diverse Indo-European languages are often related. Equus in Latin, Ech in Old Irish, Aiwa in Gothic, Ashva in Hittite, Ashva in Sanskrit, Aspa in Old Persian, and Ashva in Lithuanian. The reconstructed Proto-Indo-European word for horse is ekos. The Proto-Indo-European term for the taming of animals is tem. These are some of the words derived from it. Gamkrelidzi and Ivanov theorized that the root could mean both tame and rape, which indicates a symbolic connection between the taming of animals and the rituals of marriage, in which a woman needed to be broken in or tamed. The rituals I will discuss in this video mirror this, and please be aware that some of them involve explicit sexual acts such as rape. The horse sacrifice is historically attested mainly in Indian, Irish and Latin sources, but there are also traces in Iranian, Greek, Armenian and Germanic traditions. This video will focus mainly on the Germanic examples, both in Viking Age literature and also in much earlier archaeological evidence. However, we will first look at some of the other examples and since the most comprehensively described and best preserved written evidence comes from India in the form of the Atavamada, we will begin with that. The Ashvamada was a divine ritual used by ancient kings to prove their imperial sovereignty. It was a new and full moon sacrifice, just like Norse Yul, which also involved a horse sacrifice and took place on the full moon after the new moon of the second of the two months of Yule. However, the Ashvamada began in spring and took more than a year to complete. There is no shortage of sources describing it in detail. The earliest is the Rigveda. Later texts include the Shatapada Brahmana, the Yajurveda, 
and Book 14 of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. In the Mahabharata, the rite is for the atonement of sin, while in the Ramayana it relates to fertility. Both functions are related since atonement purifies and spiritual purity enhances fertility. The Ashvamada varies in different descriptions, but it's always an enormous event involving thousands of people and as many as 636 sacrificial beasts, the most important of which was a white stallion. Shatapada Brahmana specifies that this horse is the sun and also that the horse's chariot represents the sun too. This solar stallion was allowed to roam freely for a year, attended by the king's men, and whichever lands the horse strayed into, the king was then obliged to conquer and claim. The horse returns after a year, just like the annual journey of the sun, and is then killed as the culmination of a great sacrifice of several hundred animals. The rite glorified the king, but also secured the fertility of his kingdom. Only the king, from the Kshatriya caste, was allowed to perform this sacrifice. He proves his strength by conquering the kingdoms the stallion walks into, but whenever a man kills kinsmen, he acquires karma, or sin. However, the horse sacrifice absolves him of all sin. Mirtya Iliada believed the sacrifice may originally have been for the Indo-European sky father. He wrote that the horse is identified with the cosmos and the sacrificing of it symbolizes, that is, reproduces, the act of creation. That the Ashvamada is at the same time a ritual of initiation is shown clearly. The initiation is in fact a conquest of immortality and a change over from the human to divine state. Through this elaborate rite, the king proves his divine strength in the presence of thousands, including other kings and even gods. The king himself seems to represent Indra, the king of heaven, a fighting god who was associated with the Kshatriya caste of warriors and kings. Indra makes the dry earth fertile with his rains, just as the king must shower his people with prosperity. This is symbolized in the ritual when the horse is prepared on the altar for consumption and the king distributes meat to the more prestigious guests. Even Indra himself partakes of the holy meal. The common members of the audience are given food too, but they are not given horse flesh. As we shall see later, the king sharing the horse meat with his people is also included in the Irish and Norse versions of this rite. While the rite is mainly for the fertility of the land, in the Ramayana it says that the rite ensured the fertility of the king himself, so that he could have a son. In some versions of the rite, the queen symbolically mates with the stallion, either by going underneath a white veil with it before it is sacrificed, or by laying down next to the dead horse after it has been killed. However, some texts do indicate this mating was not always entirely symbolic. In the version of the rite called Ashvamada Yajna, which was concerned with the fertility of the queen, it seems the queen may originally have been penetrated by the severed phallus of the sacrificed stallion, which was then burned. Shatapada Brahmana describes the queen going beneath a white veil with the stallion, where, surrounded by over 400 attendants, she has sex with the horse while saying, May the vigorous virile male, the layer of seed, lay the seed. The other participants shout obscene banter at this part also, and the whole thing seems inappropriate for a queen. It is likely, one hopes, that the queen did not actually have sex with the horse, at least in later versions, but it seems she may well have in an earlier version of the rite. In Harivamha Parva, dated about 300 AD, it describes how Indra's desire invalidated the Ashvamada because he lusted after the queen and entered the dead body of the horse before she could have sex with it. 
Indra was originally a highly esteemed god in the earliest Hindu texts, but he is later associated with certain vices, and that's what I think he represents here. This story may indicate that the queen was not supposed to have sex with the dead horse at all, or that if she was, then there must be no desire, not even from a god. Perhaps the rite was no longer approved of by the 4th century. It certainly doesn't exist in modern India. The Shatapada Brahmana and several sutras connect the Ashvamada to another and related version of the rite, which involved a human victim rather than a horse. Known as Purusha Metta, the rite required a human victim of either the Brahmin or Kshatriya caste, who was purchased from his family for 1,000 cows and 100 horses. Like the horse, he is set free for a year, during which time he was allowed to indulge in everything except sex. After the year, there is a five-day ritual, with the victim throttled to death on the second day, and the queen has sex with him as he dies, or afterwards with his corpse. Many other lower humans were also killed as part of this rite. It clearly follows the same pattern as the Ashvamada, indicating that horse and human sacrifice were related. The indulgence of the victim prior to the rite and the death by throttling are also seen in the 10th century funerary rites of the Norse on the Volga described by the Arab Ibn Fadlan, to whom I will return later. This video is sponsored by Epic Loop, which provides a wide range of jewellery based on the symbols from the Viking Age. Use the exclusive discount code you see on screen now to get free shipping on your order. By making a purchase, you also stand to win one of five products from the Trending Collection as part of a free giveaway deal. The pioneer of comparative Indo-European mythology, Georges Dumasil, argued convincingly that the Roman rite called October Horse preserved remnants of a common Indo-European ritual linked to kingship, which was analogous to the Vedic Ashvamade, and also to the Irish equivalent. The October Horse was a sacrifice for the god Mars, held on the Campus Martius in Rome each year on the 15th of October. We have four accounts of it from Polybius, Plutarch, Festus, and Paulus Diaconus. The right-hand horse from the winning pair in a chariot race was sacrificed with a spear, and according to both Plutarch and Festus, its tail was carried to the regia, where it was used to bloody the altar stone, so that it shared the sacrifice. The severed head of the horse was fought over by competing factions from Subara and Sacravia. The necessity of it being the right-hand horse of the chariot is reflected in India too, where it is written that the Ashvamada victim must excel on the right part of the yoke. The tail also plays a similar role in the Ashvamada. Vedic Indra, being associated with the Kshatriya caste, can be seen as equivalent to the Roman war god Mars in some ways too. There is even an equivalence to the human sacrifice of Purushameda, which also proves October horse has an association with kingship. Caesar revived the long-forgotten human sacrifice version of the October horse in preparation for his plan to restore monarchy. The substitution of a human victim for the horse was evidently possible in the original Indo-European rite. Pausanias describes a funerary horse sacrifice in ancient Greece, in which Tyndarius, the king of Sparta, made his stepdaughter Helen Suitors stand upon the pieces of the sacrificed horse and swear oaths to protect her. Here again we see it is the king who sacrifices the horse, and there is a sexual element too. In Greek myth we see a divine horse rape when Demeter transformed into a mare to evade the lusty Poseidon until he turned into a stallion and raped her. She then became pregnant with the horse called Arion. Greeks sacrificed white horses to Poseidon and to the sun, and white mares were sacrificed at the graves of young women who had been raped and subsequently committed suicide. Mm -hmm. 
The Greek historian Herodotus is one of the only sources we have on the religion of the Scythians, a nomadic steppe people of the Iron Age who descended from the Bronze Age Syntashta culture I mentioned earlier. He says they sacrificed horses as part of a king's funeral. The entire scene was replicated in the recent Kazakh film Tomiris. Herodotus says the Scythians buried their king with one of his concubines, who they strangled to death. Also his wine server, his cook, his horse groom and his messenger, and a number of horses and valuable possessions. The account is validated by archaeological evidence, such as this Iron Age Scythian barrow, which included horse inhumation. The account bears a striking resemblance to the aforementioned Arabic account of a Viking king's funeral written some 1400 years later and which not only included horse sacrifice, but also the ritual strangling of a slave girl who was first raped. I should remind you that the male human victim of the Purusha Medha was also strangled to death, and then the queen raped his dead body. I wouldn't be surprised if Herodotus neglected to mention that the Scythians also raped their king's concubine prior to killing her, as this seems to have been an original element of the Indo-European ritual. The Irish version of the royal horse sacrifice is preserved in a 12th century account by the Welsh Norman Archdeacon of Brecon, Gerald of Wales. As a Christian, Gerald scorned the tradition, and so the source may not be entirely accurate, but it strongly resembles the other examples we have discussed. He wrote that in northern Ulster, the people all gather together in one place to appoint their new king. A white mare is brought before the crowd, and then the man who is to be king has sex with it, after which it is sacrificed, cut up into pieces and cooked in a broth. The king then climbs into a bath of this broth, surrounded by his people, and then he drinks the broth and distributes pieces of horse meat to the crowd. Gerald says it is through this rite that his kingship and dominion have been conferred. The king strengthens the bond between the ruled and the ruler through a social rite which reflects his compassion and generosity. Just as in the other examples, we can see the king leads the rite, shares the sacrifice with others, and also that there is a sexual element where the victim is raped prior to sacrifice. When looking at Norse sources, we not only have medieval depictions of the Germanic mythology and the role of horses in it, but we can also look right back through the archaeological record to the Nordic Bronze Age. Domestic horses show up in Scandinavia with the Indo-Europeans at the start of the Bronze Age, but they become much more common in the later Bronze Age from around 3,000 years ago. These finds from a bog in Gala Morse, Denmark, include chariot parts dating to around 4,000 years ago, making them about as old as the oldest Sintashta chariots. Bronze Age rock art also shows the prominence of horses and chariot. Examples from Sweden include Vilfarastenen, Österristningen, and the chariot depicted on the Kivik grave. But the Trundholm chariot is the best and most clear evidence of the horse's role in a solar Indo-European cult in Bronze Age Scandinavia. In the much later Norse mythology of the Viking era, the sun goddess Sol, known as Suna in Germany and England, is the sister of Morne, the moon, and she drives the sun's chariot across the sky. The Gotland picture stones, many of which predate the Viking era, frequently depict a solar disc next to two horses, which likely represent the divine horse twins of Indo-European mythology, who marry and or rescue the sun goddess from the sea. 
the Viking Age Norse were clearly anxious about the imminent death of the sun, which in their mythology was destined to be swallowed by the wolf Fenrir. Besides the medieval depictions of Norse mythology, we also have a few historical accounts of Germanic rituals involving horses, the oldest of which comes from the Roman historian Tacitus some 2000 years ago. He relates how the Germans not only used the flights of birds to tell the future, just as Romans did, but also used horses for prognostication. The pure white horses, he writes, were kept in sacred groves and forests and were never ridden or worked. The king and priest yoke them to a sacred chariot and walk beside them, taking note of the neighs and snorts by which they are able to determine the will of the gods. A very similar custom is recorded by the German chronicler Adam of Bremen over 1000 years later. He wrote that the Swedes did the same thing, except that it wasn't just the king and priest who did it, but all social classes. So the right had lost its Indo-European elite exclusivity by the Viking Age. Adam also describes how the Swedes held an enormous sacrifice at the temple of Uppsala, which involved the ritual hanging of nine male animals from every species available, including horses. This seems to have been an offering to Odin, the god of the hanged. Fjetmar of Merseburg wrote of the pagan activities in Leire, Denmark in the early 10th century, as in Uppsala, the worshippers gathered every ninth year. The sacrifice involved 99 people and 99 horses, dogs and cocks. This same sacrificial formula of nine is seen in the Stentoften runestone in Blekinge, Sweden, dated to 600 AD, which has a curse inscribed upon it stating, with nine billy goats, with nine horses, gave Hathulfr a good year. Odin specifies in Horvamal that he hangs for nine nights as a sacrifice to himself, so again the number nine indicates this was an Odinic rite. A lesser known written source for Norse horse sacrifice is found in the Hervara saga during the inauguration of the last pagan king of Uppsala, Blot Svein, that is Svein, the performer of sacrifice. A horse is dismembered and cut into pieces, and the meat is then distributed among worshippers to eat. Then, the blood is sprinkled on the sacred tree in Uppsala. Horse sacrifices were also common in funerary contexts, and this is supported not only by archaeology, but by an account from the 10th century Arabic emissary of the Emir of Baghdad, Ibn Fadlan. He describes how two horses were run until sweaty and were then cut up with a sword and placed in a boat with other animals and a slave girl. The girl has ritual sex with each of her lord's men prior to the horse sacrifice and is then raped again after the horses are killed, before she herself is stabbed by a priestess and simultaneously strangled by the lord's men. All the sacrificial victims were then burned and finally buried. This account bears a close resemblance to archaeological evidence of Norse funerals. The way they drove the horses until they were sweaty and then sacrificed them and then raped the slave girl is structurally similar to the sexual rites of the horse sacrifice in the Ashvamida and the Scythian example I mentioned earlier. The clearest example of the royal Indo-European horse sacrifice in Norse sources comes from the saga of King Hawkon the Good in Heimskringla. It depicts the Yule festivities in Trondheim in Norway during the 950s AD, which it was apparently essential the king participated in. Many kinds of animals are sacrificed there, but only horses are specifically mentioned. It is also the sacrificial horse meat which causes a major dispute between the people and their Christian king when he refuses to eat it. The saga explains 
that the blood of the animals was collected in bowls and then sprinkled on the congregation and the hall itself with special sticks, but that the meat was all cooked for a feast. The sprinkling of blood in this way can also be seen in the Roman cult of Mithras or in the feast scene in the Odyssey, in which blood is the means by which the dead may be revived and communicated with. So horse blood was sprinkled on the congregation at Yule so that the people there could all benefit from the sacrifice and share in its power with their king. The sharing and eating of the horse meat has the exact same function as the sprinkling of sacrificial blood. But King Harkon offended his people when he made the sign of the cross over the food and then had to pretend he had only made the sign of Thor's hammer lest the pagans grow violent. But he still wouldn't eat the horse meat, and this made them furious. The following year, they actually forced their own king to eat horse liver, and in another source, Orgrip, they threatened to drive the king from the throne if he would not eat the horse meat. Their absolute insistence on the king's participation in the rite, particularly the part where the horse meat is consumed and distributed, is obviously explained by the meaning apparent from all the aforementioned Indo-European royal horse sacrifices. It was essential for the health of the land that the king ate the sacrificial horse meat. This clearly demonstrates how important this Indo-European belief connecting the king to a solar horse cult still was for Viking Age Norwegians. Several gods were associated with the Yule sacrifice. The first toast at the Yule Feast is said to have been for Odin, for victory and power to the king, reinforcing the essential royal aspect of the rite. The second toast was for the fertility gods, Njordr and his son Freyr, for good harvests and for peace. And finally, a toast was drunk to the king himself. Other sources show that the sacrifice of a boar on which oaths were sworn was also an important Yule ritual, and many connect this boar to Freyr, which is probably correct, but Freyr was also very much associated with horses, as we shall see later. Odin had an eight-legged horse called Sleipnir, and Vendel-era depictions of Odinic warriors are sometimes mounted. The association of Odin with horses is very old, and not limited to Norse sources. In Germany he was called Wotan and is invoked in the second Merseburg charm to heal a horse's leg. Horses were valuable possessions so it makes sense that an aristocratic god like Odin was the patron of a horse cult. Unlike the Irish and Indian examples of the horse sacrifice, Germanic sources do not refer to any kind of ritual sex with horses or other animals. But there is a section of Olaf's saga Helga, known as Volsevater, in which the people of a farmstead are said to venerate a horse penis, preserved with onions, wrapped in linen, and called Volsi, which evidently represented a god, perhaps Freyr. The women make lewd remarks, implying they might pleasure themselves with it. This cult was connected to the farm and fertility and can justifiably be associated with Freyr, but the name Volsi is connected to the race of kings and heroes descended from Volsung, Odin's grandson. Volsi is the family name of Odin's line, but it literally means penis, either horses or humans, and this hints at an ancient connection between Odinic aristocracy and the horse sacrifice. Among the Anglo-Saxons too, we may see a hint of this same tradition. In a 12th century chronicle, King Edgar's wife was accused of using magic to take on the form of a horse and was reported by a bishop who claimed to have seen her running and leaping hither and thither with horses and showing herself shamelessly to them. The Nordic tradition of horse fights also known as Skeid or Hestavig, most likely originated as part of the cult of the god Freyr, whose main sacrificial beast was the horse, 
and to whom live horses were also dedicated, as we see in Hrafnkal's saga Freysgola, where Hrafnkal, a devotee of Freyr, dedicates a dark stallion to his god and calls it Freyfaxi. Freyfaxi was formerly a victorious fighting horse used in Skeid. Such horse fights were originally intended to ensure the fertility of the land. This migration era picture stone from Hergeby in Uppland, Sweden, has been argued to be the earliest depiction of a horse fight. The Danish horns of Gallohus, dated to around the same time, may also include a ritual horse race or fight scene. Horse fights in Viking sagas are depicted as raucous affairs that can lead to human fights. Stallions would fight over a mare guarded by a man with a pole. The skeard is described in Greta's saga. The stallions were then led forward while the other horses were kept farther out on the riverbank. They were tied together as a group, standing on the bank just above a deep pool. The stallions fought well, providing fine sport. But it didn't end in Viking times. There are numerous accounts of horse fights in Norway and Sweden from the 18th and 19th centuries. An account of the fight held at Furestal in Norway over the summer of 1618 reveals that people still thought that the horses biting each other improved the quality of the annual harvest. Over time, horse fights developed into larger affairs, with horse races, market stalls, wrestling, dancing, a lot of brandy and violence. These midsummer events became known as mountain dances in Norway and only ended in the 1890s due to escalating violence. The last mountain dance at Rådal in 1897 ended with a man being stabbed to death and was cancelled thenceforth. Another account details a skeard which occurred in Valla in September when the boy who guards the mare from the aroused stallions using a long pole held the mare with her tail end towards Frick's hall, and Frick is another way of saying Freyr, the Norse god of fertility. Since we know this was a fertility rite, the association with that god is quite clear. Skeard didn't just occur in summer, but also in September and over Christmas time, particularly on St. Stephen's Day. The Yuletide horse fights were evidently a continuation of the same tradition of the royal Yule horse sacrifice, which King Hawken had objected to all the way back in Viking times. Germanic burials from the Bronze Age through to the Viking Age often include horse burials and cremations. These have variously been interpreted as part of a cult of Freyr or as status symbols and transportation for the noble dead to ride to the next world. These are not mutually exclusive explanations, and the diversity of horse sacrifices suggests diverse meanings for them. Horga Mound, near Uppsala, dating to around the 14th century BC, is one of the most lavish burials of the Nordic Bronze Age, containing more gold than any other. As well as a cremated man, six to seven cattle and at least one horse were interred in the barrow. The fact that the man was so high status, likely a king, and that there were so few horses, emphasizes that they were very elite status symbols whose sacrifice was associated with royalty, like in the Ashvamida. Many of the Vendel era ship burials at Vendel and Valsierda in Sweden included horse sacrifices, among many other animals but they differ from examples like the much older Skirda Morsa, an Iron Age site which has specifically been identified as of a sacrificial nature involving the consumption of horse flesh, just as in the aforementioned Yule Rite. The first part of the name Skirda Morsa refers to the Skird horse fights, showing this was likely the annual site of such events going far back into the Iron Age and perhaps further. The ritual area around the barrows of Old Uppsala is not only connected to horse sacrifice through the aforementioned historical evidence, but also through archaeological evidence unearthed in recent years. 
A survey from 2014 showed that horses are present in 31% of the Vendel era graves, and in 17% of the Viking era graves. Most of these involved the cremation of an entire horse, which was the common practice all around Lake Malar in this period. In Norway, horses in Viking era graves were less common, constituting just 7%, but in Iceland they are found in about 40% of Viking era graves. However, literary and archaeological evidence combined seem to indicate that Uppsala was the most important royal sacrificial centre in the Nordic pagan world. Horse burial in the continent after the fall of Rome began with the Saxons, Thuringians and Lombards, although their non-Germanic neighbours, the Huns, also had a similar tradition, which they brought from the steppes. The horse burials in Anglo-Saxon England can be divided into two broad categories. The status symbol horse burials of the warrior aristocracy and the more popular horse cremations, which were less elite. Most of the horses buried were stallions and most are buried with male humans. The majority of Anglo-Saxon cemeteries containing horse remains are in the regions of the Humber estuary, the Wash and North Norfolk. Since the horse serves both an aristocratic military and an agrarian function, we might assume the military horse burials pertain to Woden as a god of war, and the horse cremations to Ingwifrey as a god of fertility. Back in Scandinavia, the ship burial tradition with horse sacrifice seen at the Vendel era barrows of Vendel and Valsjeda in Sweden continue long into the Viking era with the most magnificent example seen in the enormous Viking ship burial at Usberg in Norway, dated to 834 AD. It was a queen's funeral, accompanied by between 10 to 20 horse skeletons, most of which were decapitated. A similar queen's funeral involving a boat was depicted in season 6 of History Channel's Vikings drama series. You can see the decapitated horse heads here. The burial also contained two long poles, which have been theorized to be skeared poles since they were found near the horses, but they are generally thought to be oars. One of the floorboards of the ship was engraved with this image, which can be interpreted as a horse fight. Further Bronze Age evidence for the horse cult is seen at the Kivik King's Grave in Scania, southern Sweden, which not only features rock art depicting horses and chariots, but also contained a horse tooth, which had been dated between the 17th and 13th century BC. The Kivik grave is quite similar to the Barrow grave at Sagaholm, which contains 42 stone slabs, 75% of which feature rock art depicting horses. One of these actually shows a man having sex with a mare, just like in the Irish tradition. The artwork for each of these two Bronze Age graves is thought to depict the rituals of the funeral itself. Some of them appear to depict horse fights, or an early version of the skeared tradition. It can clearly be seen that they relate to the Indo-European cult of horse sacrifice seen in the diverse cultures described previously. The rites pertain to a display of power over a powerful animal. By virtue of its power, the horse became a symbol of the power of the sun upon which so much depended. It was the king's responsibility to demonstrate his power as a ruler by taming this beast. And remember, the Indo-European word for tame could also have sexual connotations associated with rape. Although in India, the explicit sexual role seems to have been switched to a stallion and the queen, all the sources together indicate that the original Proto-Indo-European rite only involved the king copulating with a mare. The Romans made the gender of the horse irrelevant and the Norse developed the ritual in complicated ways which made the sexual aspect obsolete. 
but only the Irish preserved the original right beyond the Bronze Age. Raping an animal as strong as a horse is very dangerous and would have been a spectacular public event, proving the king's virility and strength. The Indo-European king would then kill this horse and share its meat with his people who were all thus empowered by consuming the flesh of a divine sacrifice. The rape and sacrifice of a horse was the domination not merely of an animal, but of cosmic forces that threatened everything in human society. A king who couldn't do that was not worth having as a king. I will end with one more Indo-European source, one which I rarely rely on, the Hittites of Anatolia. Like their Semitic neighbours, the Hittites had strict laws against bestiality, which was punishable by death. But the Hittite law codes make an exception for those who have sex with horses or mules, which would not warrant a punishment, but would preclude the perpetrator from ever becoming a priest. This once again shows how this taboo practice was limited to potential kings among the warrior caste. It was not a common sexual practice, and these people abhorred bestiality even more than we do. But they had preserved the prehistoric Indo-European cult of kingship, which was explicitly connected to the rite of horse sacrifice. Do take a look at some of my other videos on ancient Indo-European religions, genetics and folk customs if you want to learn more. And don't forget to hit subscribe and the notifications bell. You can also access exclusive private videos which I make just for patrons if you sign up for either Patreon or Subscribestar for as little as the price of a pint per month. The links for these are in the description. If you support me, you will be ensuring this channel continues to survive and celebrate ancient European history for years to come. So thank you so much.